Entangling Vines, Case 35. Kanzan's works like a thief. Kanzan again said, the koan, Joshu's juniper tree, works like a thief. We have come together here from all different parts of the world. I see Europe. I see the East Coast, the West Coast, all different areas of this world. And this technology brings us together. But before praising what we as human beings have achieved in terms of figuring out how to work in this world, let us acknowledge that we are sitting here in this way, not necessarily by choice. This is the second Hoan session where we can't travel as freely as we want to where our health, the health of many other human beings is in jeopardy. And of course, where hundreds of thousands have died from this novel coronavirus, millions in the entire world. And we who are lucky might have been vaccinated. We might be sitting in a country that's sitting on a number of doses that people refuse to take, while other human beings have no access. So I just want to give a short acknowledgement to the tremendous challenges in which we find ourselves to the tremendous losses that we have experienced. I'm sure each of you knows somebody who knows somebody who was affected. So, but we have come together in this ho on session ho on suru is translated sometimes to requite the beneficence that we have received it is an opportunity for us who have encountered the buddha dharma who have encountered this teaching of rinzai zen embodied by the founder of Rinzai Ji. And with that, it is incumbent on us to continue our practice, to deepen our practice, and to pay forward, to give freely what we have so generously received. In 1962, Joshu Roshi stepped off the plane. He continued the work that other monks had started earlier in the century. In fact, if you go to downtown Los Angeles and you go to little Tokyo, that's where Nyogen Senzaki practiced. 
He died in 1958. And it is nice to know that after hiatus of four years, students of Senzaki Osho were able to pick up their practice with Joshu Roshi. So something has brought us here together today. And we all have our various functions in which we appear. The Jikijitsu, taking care of the time. The Shoji, helping serve the tea to the Buddha, to the Bodhisattvas, sitting on the tan. And I sit here and I'm tasked with giving a talk, a talk referring to some old piece of language. But that's really not it. The question is, how do we make this old stuff come alive? How do we make it be relevant? It wasn't written for the sake of writing down language, especially in this case. So what I started is to give talks on the collection that's called Shumon Katoshu, Entangling Vines. It's uh, a couple hundred koans that were compiled in Japan. So from that point of view, it's already a different kind of collection than let's say the Gateless Gate, the Mumonkan, or the Blue Cliff record, the Hikigan Roku, even different than the Shoyo Roku, the Book of Equanimity. And we have come sequentially through the cases. That is another manifestation of this practice. Once you decide to give talks on a specific collection of koans, there is no choice in it. You start with one, then comes two, three, four, five, and so on. And today we have arrived at case number 35. This is a very interesting case. Interesting from the point of view that when we talk about cases, usually the main actors in the cases are Chinese Chan masters from the Tang dynasty, from the heyday of Zen, anywhere between Bodhidharma and the time when this tradition made its way to Japan. But today, in this koan, we encounter a Japanese priest. Tanzan Egen. It might be that you have heard the name before. It might be that you have never heard the name. But from the point of view of the tradition, we find ourselves in here. He is very important. So the question shall be first, who was Kanzan Egen? The Shumon Katoshu, the Entangling Vines, has 280 some cases. And less than 10 of those cases actually have Japanese a persona in it. One of them is Hakuin Ekaku Zenji, who lived much later. And the other one is Kanzan Egen. He appears in four cases of this collection. His name, Egen. E means wise, and gen means mysterious, profound, deep. And he is the founder of a temple by the name of Myoshinji in Kyoto, in Japan. Founder, founding abbot, in the same sense that Joshu Roshi, 
is the founding abbot of Rinzaiji. Well, there were a few differences. Rinzaiji, formerly Cimarron Zen Center, and all the other centers were not there when Joshu Roshi came. Kanzan Egen was called to be the first abbot of Myoshinji by Hanazono Teno, by a retired emperor of Japan who already had donated, even though it was a poor place, a temple for him to come to. So this Myoshinji temple has the temple name Shobozan, True Dharma Mountain. That is the name of Myoshinji. And the Shobozan Roku Soden is the history of the first six abbots of this temple Myoshinji. So Kanzan Egen was born in Japan, in the Shimano uh, province, which is now Nagano, on January 7th, 1277. He was ordained in Kamakura at Kenchoji, which is one of the first Zen temples in Japan. And he met first Nampo Jomyo, who is in the first generation of the Japanese Rinzai Zen tradition. Nampo Jomyo, who was the abbot of this temple Kenchoji at the time. It was also Nampo Jomyo who gave the name Egen to the young monk. But soon Nampo Jomyo passed away. And his successor, Shuho Myocho, the founder of Dai Tokuji in Kyoto, became his teacher, and Kanzan completed his training under this teacher. So sometimes in the Japanese tradition, after somebody dies of great significance, a special name is bestowed unto them. National teacher is such a title. And before national teacher comes a name that is given by the emperor. So these three folks we are talking here, uh, or we're talking about here. The first two, Nampo Jomyo and Shuho Myocho, we know them better as Dai O Kokushi and Dai To Kokushi. So They were the first, the second, and Kanzan Egen, the third ancestor in our Japanese lineage. And all Japanese Rinzai Zen lineages go back to these three. And taking from the second character of their given Kokushi name, we have O To Kan. So this is the Oto Kan lineage in which Joshu Roshi taught, in which every living Japanese Rinzai Zen master teaches. Otokan. So after having received transmission, Kanzan Egen decided to go into the mountains, into the mountains of Ibuka in Mino, which is in the present Gifu, uh, prefecture to engage in post awakening training. And there he worked as a laborer. This is a very important step in the way how the Rinzai school trains its monks and the monastics. There's this important part after awakening, after being entrusted with teaching the Dharma, that one goes back into society to wash off any stink of Zen, to wash off any ideas that were
taken from the monastery and to see real life again, to have to deal, to, to have to deal with work, to have to deal with all of that, what we call everyday life. So that's what he did. And he lasted in those mountains until the Emperor Hanazono called for him to come to Kyoto and to become the first abbot of Myoshinji. So coming into the city, Kanzan again devoted himself to training his disciples and he became known for his ascetic lifestyle. And his training methods as well were very strict. Some of us have been at Myoshinji and between the founder's hall and the hall of Hanazono Ho'o, that is the founder in terms of having giving, given the land and the money, there's a little breezeway and a piece of grass where there is a well. And this well is very, very famous for the, uh, for the story that when Kanzanegen felt that he's going to die, he put on his travel gear as a traveling monk and he went and he stood next to this Fu Sui Sen, the wind and water spring where he gave his last admonition and died. I remember Noritake Roshi explaining the story to us, standing in the very spot where Kanzan Egen had dropped his body. Muso Daishi is the title that was given to Kanzan Egen by Emperor Meiji later. So institutionally speaking, this is a very important person, but also in terms of teaching, it is quite interesting to know one thing about Kanzan Egen, namely that he has left, guess how many volumes of scriptures will he have produced or recorded sayings of Kanzan Egen? None, none whatsoever. There are only a few things of his teaching that remain. And some of them are very famous and some of them make it into a koan like the one we are looking at today. The other ones, uh, so you know, one is ko sono moto tsutumeyo. I beseech you, examine the source. These were words in his final admonition to the monks just before he dropped his body. The other one we heard about the Hakujushi no wa ni zokuki ari, today's koan, Joshu's. Juniper tree works like a thief. And there's another story in which it is reported that a monk came to Myoshinji and there was Kanzanegen. And the monk asked him, I have come here to learn about the great matter of life and death. To which Kanzan answered, which means there is no birth and death in my place. Wonderful. One of the basic principles of Kanzan Egen's teaching was his ref reference to Honnu Enjo Butsu, the inherently perfect Buddha. The fact that we all are endowed with Buddha nature as our birthright. 
and he spurred on his students by asking them, so if we are all inherently perfect Buddhas, why then have we become ignorant, deluded, sentient beings? So, ko sono moto o tsutomeo, I beseech you, examine the source. For that reason, Zazen is the main activity. The main activity in the monastery and what we do during this session. Of course, during the time when Kanzan Egen lived, there were other famous Zen masters in Kyoto. One of them, for example, was Muso Soseki, who also gave lectures at the imperial court. And the story has it that one day, Muso Soseki was passing by Myoshinji and he saw Kanzan with a broom raking, sweeping leaves. And by seeing this eminent teacher and abbot be engaged in this absolutely ordinary activity, Musuo Soseki commented, all my disciple may leave me for Kanzan. But still, he continued on to the imperial palace to give his talk. So this is uh, Kanzan Egen, the founder of Myoshinji. And of course, if you know a little bit about the history of Rinzai-ji, you know that it was Myoshinji sending over Joshu Roshi. There's another connection this connection, these Dharma connections that we have, sometimes in Japanese it's called innen. So the, these connections are so close and so interesting to discover because what happens when you discover these connections? The mandala, the connection, the network of this timeless, spaceless, red thread of life, of Dharma life, in which we find ourselves has so many connections that we discover over time. I know Shoei-san knows, for example, that Kanzanegen is also the founder of so Shogenji in Gifu. Shogenji, where we have Muinken Rodaishi, that is Yamakawa Roshi. And Myoren-san from Rinzai-ji is training at Shogenji at this very moment, founded by Kanzan Egen. If you go on to the Myoshinji Facebook page, yes, they have one. You might see photos of ceremonies, including the founder's ceremony to commemorate Kanzan Egen. And it is celebrated by the head abbot, the Kancho of Myoshinji. But then on the left side of the Butsudan, sit in ranking order other abbots. The first one who always sits there is Noritake Roshi. Next to him, Yamakawa Roshi, because he is the abbot of a temple that was founded by Kanzanegen. So many, many connections. And if we have the luck to meet these Roshis, if we had the luck to meet Joshu Roshi, Noritake Roshi, Yamakawa Roshi, all of them, 
the humanity and the warmth, the clarity of heart and purpose is what impresses way more than any kind of institutional history. The spark of this human endeavor of awakening, of maturing, is truly embodied. So, one more point to the history. If you're well read, or if you know a little bit about the Japanese uh, schools of Zen, there are three different schools. One is the Soto school, the Rinzai school, and then there's a third one. It's called the Obaku school. And the Obaku school came to Japan fairly late. And it was one specific person, the master Ingen Ryuki, who was born in 1592, who brought over the Zen from Obaku-san, the temple that was called Obaku, to Japan. That's the Ming dynasty, very different than the Zen that came before. And very different, of course, than the Zen that, you know, when Obaku Kion lived, the teacher of Rinzai Gigen. So Ingen came over, he was invited to come into Nagasaki because that's on the side facing China. And there were Chinese merchants there and Chinese Buddhist temples and artists. So Ingen Ryuki came over and the story that uh, Yamakawa Roshi told us is that Master Ingen made his way from Nagasaki closer and closer to Kyoto. And on the way, he stopped at every temple. Show me the records of your founder. Show me the teachings of your temple. And he engaged in Dharma combat. And so on his way towards Kyoto, he picked up all kinds of temple to follow him and his school. And the story goes that when he arrived at Myoshinji, he would ask again, bring me the records of your founder. I'm sorry, but there are no records. And tell me about his teaching. And the only things they could tell him is, well, at Egan's place, there is no birth or death. And according to the story, Master Ingen deeply bowed and accepted this temple as the first temple that had its own living transmission of the Buddha's teaching. That's how the story goes. Of course, Historians tell it very different today. Today, we know that Master Ingen was called to Myoshinji because many people thought he should take it over because he had a direct line of transmission from Rinzai Gigen through the Obaku Temple in China. But by that time, the Zen tradition had already become so enmeshed in the Japanese culture that these Chinese elements from the Ming dynasty that came over did not taste according to the Japanese predilections. And Myoshinji declined making Ingen Ryuki the main abbot. So please feel free to, to move if you need. Now, in this koan, 
we find a reference to yet another koan, and that is Joshu Jushin, the famous Joshu, who we know from Joshu's Mu. Joshu, the stone bridge, so many koans with Joshu. And this koan just summarized the main parts is a monk asked Joshu, what is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? And Joshu looked out the window and said, the juniper tree in the garden. So we mostly know it as oak tree, especially those who have studied with uh, Joshu Roshi, oak tree in the garden. Whatever it is, an oak tree or a juniper doesn't really matter. You know, the, uh, the Japanese term is kashiwa, which is not a Chinese reading actually. And it is a type of juniper tree. It's a type of juniper tree and Harada Roshi from, Harada Roshi from Sogenji in, in Tahoma, but also in Japan, he points out that the Chinese juniper tree gives it an extra flavor because the wood that the juniper tree grows, you cannot use for anything. You can't make lumber of it. You cannot make furniture of it. It doesn't probably burn that well. So it's kind of the most useless wood that you can think of. So juniper tree in the garden. This is the koan to which Kanzan Egen points here. So what is that question? What is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? What is the meaning of Buddhism? What is the meaning of this life? But the Bodhidharma question has been asked many times of many masters. Being in the Rinzai tradition, of course, we can go back to Master Rinzai himself. In number seven, in the Rinzai Roku, someone asked the master, what is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? The master answered, if he had had any meaning, he could not even have saved himself. To put it more contemporary, what is the meaning of Joshu Roshi stepping off the plane at Los Angeles International Airport. How do we answer these questions? Who am I? What is truth? What is enlightenment? Am I awakened? Are you awakened? Is anyone awakened? Is my Buddha nature eternal? If my Buddha nature is eternal, what happens to it when I die? If not eternal, what happens to it when I die? All kinds of questions. How do we answer these questions? Well, fortunately, we are not only in the tradition of the Japanese Rinzai Zen, but we go back with the teachings to Shakyamuni Buddha, to the Buddha himself. And there's a wonderful parable story that he tells that we are told about exactly these kind of questions. In, in the Sutra 63 of the Majima Nikaya, 
there's a monk described by the name of Malunkya Putta. And he was troubled with these kinds of questions. And he wondered, why did my teacher Shakyamuni set aside and reject the following issues and questions? The world is eternal. The world is not eternal. The world is finite. The world is infinite. The soul is the same as the body. The spirit is one thing and the body another. After death, the Tathagata exists. After death, does the Tathagata not exist? After death, the Tathagata both exists and doesn't exist. After death, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. Malunkya Putta was so troubled by these questions that he confronted the Buddha himself. And he said, if I cannot clarify them by myself and you cannot tell me how to clarify these questions, I shall abandon my training and return to the common life. Shakyamuni explained to Malunkya Putta that he left these questions undeclared because they are unbeneficial and do not belong to the fundamentals of the investigation of the self. They do not lead to awakening, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to awakening or nirvana. And so he told the parable of the wounded man. He said, suppose Malunkya Putta, a man were to be wounded by an arrow, thickly smeared with poison, and his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives, brought a surgeon to treat him. The man would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out this arrow until I know whether the man who wounded me was a nobleman, a Brahmin, or a merchant or a worker. And he would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out this arrow until I know the name and clan of the man who wounded me. Until I know the man who wounded me was tall or short or of middle height. Until I know whether the man who wounded me was dark or brown or golden skin. Until I know whether the man who wounded me lives in such a village or such a town until I know whether the bow that wounded me was a long bow or a crossbow, until I know whether the bowstring that wounded me was fiber or reed or sinew or hemp or bark, until I know whether the shaft that wounded me was wild or cultivated, until I know with what kind of feathers the shaft that wounded me was fitted, whether those of a vulture or a crow or a hawk or a peacock or a stork, until I know with what kind of sinew and shaft that wounded me was bound whether that of an ox or a buffalo or a lion or a monkey, until I know what kind of arrow it was that wounded me, whether it was hoof tipped or curved or barbed or calf toothed or oleander. All this would still not be known to that man. And meanwhile, the Buddha said he would die. So too, Malunkya Putta, if anyone should say thus, I will not lead the holy life under the world honored one until the world honored one declares to me the world is eternal or after death the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. That would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata and meanwhile that person would die. And what have I declared, says the Buddha? This is suffering, I have declared. This is the origin of suffering, I have declared. This is the cessation of suffering, I have declared. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering, I have declared. These are the four noble truths. 
that the Buddha declared. So, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of our suffering, of our incompleteness? Suffering is a pretty strong term at times, you know? Being unsatisfied, being incomplete, experiencing incompleteness. We human beings have this deep, deep urge to become whole, to become complete. That's why we look for a mate. That's why religions come into existence with various ways of allowing us to approach this topic of being incomplete. We follow the path of Zazen, of turning the light inwards, of shining onto that root and finding out where it is. But as we have heard, of course, just by the example of Kanzanegen. Just seeing that is not enough. There is this tremendous effort that we have to make to clearly see into our own nature. Seeing our own nature, the Japanese term for that is Kensho, Kensho Suru to see into our own nature. But then, as we know from the teachings of Nyoko Nyoraizen, Joshu Roshi's teaching, that is just one side, the side of contraction, the side of getting smaller, 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 smaller. Then we have to turn around and expand again. We experience that with every sitting. At first, we might fall into it and arrive at the point where we have reached the smallest small possible under the conditions in which we find ourselves. And very naturally, the opposing force of expansion takes over. Look at the breathing. The breath is the embodiment of this activity of Dharma. It is the embodiment that is unescapable. None of us can dictate how breathing works or declare, well, I had it with inhalation. From today on, I will only exhale. Try. Our will only goes thus far. You hold your breath after you exhale. No, I'm not going to inhale ever again. Just keep counting. Either you fall over and pass out and nature, the activity of Dharma will take over. <gasps> or you will die. So what is the meaning of that? The oak tree Koan asks, Joshu just pointing to answer this 
question that wants a declaration of meaning. What is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? Just give it to me. And Joshu says, oh, oak tree in the garden. There is no declaration in here. No talk about eternal. No talk about temporal. No talk about self and other. That oak tree, that juniper tree is there. And of course, similarly, when we look at our practice, we have to look at the tree and realize where the roots are. Every little bit that we find in the furthest branch of that tree is connected to the root. But at the same time, every leaf is connected to that what is the world around it. In fact, ask a biologist, a chemist, 80% of the carbon in that oak tree was pulled from the air. The interpenetration of this and that, of self and other, is just another idea. In the same way that the idea of who we are, of our identity, is just an idea. If we were to speak in technical terms, we would speak about Shwabhava, Shwabhava, selfhood, ego entity, separated existence, is not real. Shunyata, emptiness of selfhood, is what this teaching of Kanzan Egen of the Buddha, of Joshu Roshi, is about. And it is as real as the oak tree. If you want to find a tree, go outside, bang your head against it, and see if it's real. No matter what you call it. bringing this into our lives so that we just don't sit on the cushion and torture ourselves from the point of view of this I am self that feels through its intuition clearly that something's got to change to become complete and allowing that just to be but not to be that that usurps consciousness that requires us to think, to keep up any kind of identity. Just learning how that also appears and disappears like our breath as the phase of exhalation, self-negation, and inhalation, affirmation, both learning how to embrace all of it is the only way that will lead us to the experience of unseen, of a peaceful heart and mind. So when Kanzanegan says, Joshu's oak tree corn functions like a thief. What is being stolen? 
what is being taken away. Goes back to Rinzai. This Rinzai practice tells us who are entrusted to serve as elders going forward on this path, that the direction to lead those who come and ask to practice, that we deprive them, deprive them of anything to hold on to. That's why asking what is the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West? Oak tree in the garden deprives any kind of intellectual thinking. Nothing to hold on to. But at the same time, the oak tree, the juniper tree, is real, is there. You can feel it, you can touch it, you can smell it, you can hug it. So, after all, even these old words live in us, in our minds, how we are, what we look for, and how we can continue to embody this spark of being truly alive. Ultimately, whatever the package is, I mean, what kind of stuff you put on, what robes you wear, what titles you have, it doesn't matter. How authentically you connect, you make the relationship of being the leaves of the oak tree that becomes one with the air and interchanges carbon and oxygen, that gives itself to the ground through the roots and exchanges nutrients. To be a full part in this endless, immeasurable net of sentient beings that works according to this activity of the Dharma. It is heartening to see so many of you step onto this ancient path of humanity, because this is the only way for us, us human beings, to require the beneficence of having been born with consciousness, with the ability to think, the ability to love, the ability to mature. So thank you all for being here. And inexpressible thank you, inexpressible gratitude to Joshu Roshi, his teacher, Joten Soko, his teacher, Ban Zenzo, and on and on, every generation back to the beginning of life. May we extend this mind over the whole universe so that we and all beings together may mature in Buddha's wisdom. <laughs>